Hey everyone, it's Mike here from adventuresincre.com. Uh, today I'm going to go over the debt module that I posted to the website. First I'm going to give a brief overview of the entire module and then I'll go into the specifics and kind of show you how it works. Um, so like I do with most of my models, I try to make them as simple as and as intuitive as, as possible so that a third user can really understand what's going on. Uh, like a lot of the models, I try to keep them on one sheet. So if we zoom out here, you can see I have everything basically on one sheet that you're going to need. And I have some tables which are down below that I'll explain in a little bit, which as you can see are rolled up. And you can open them up to see what's going on later. And we'll do that in this video. So first, let's uh, take a look at what's going on in the inputs section of the model. At the top, we have the total cost of project, which you can either manually insert or you can link it back to your own DCF model. And below, in cell D10, we have the date, which you can also either manually enter or link it back to, to your own model. And below that, we have our debt inputs and return summary table. Let's scroll down here and zoom out. Here you can see we have um, all of our inputs for our senior debt, our subordinate debt, and our mezzanine debt. And you can also see that we have some uh, essential return numbers that you're going to want to see as you alter your inputs. Um, before we dive into the specifics here, I just want to show you up top that I have these labeled as senior, subordinate, and mezzanine. Uh, but you could feel free to make these any naming conventions you want. Uh, and they will flow through the model. For example, as you can see in the screen now, um, we have senior debt cash flow. It says that right here. And we have this labeled senior debt. Now I could change this to, I don't know, um, let's just write, just for example, first tier debt. And this will flow through the model. So you can name um, any of these tiers of debt, whatever you'd like to name them. All right, so let's change this back real quick. All right, so I'm not going to go into every bit of detail with this model. I'm just going to give um, a basic overview and show some of the functionality. Uh, so to start, let's let's dive into this. Uh, let's dive into row 16, specifically cell uh, D16. As you can see, you can pick between a percent of purchase price or the dollar amount. Now I want you to watch what happens as I alter between the two. You can see cell D17 is blacked out and cell D7, cell D18 is open. Now when I switch, the inverse happens. And so what happens is if you click dollar amount, then you're able to manually insert any dollar amount you want and it will alter everything. And here you can see the essential uh, return numbers that you might want to see. And as we switch back, 2% of purchase price, then the LTV row will open up and you can manually change the loan to value number. Now this is essentially how the rest of the uh, tiers work. Uh, the only minor difference is that rather than picking a percent of purchase price, uh, the other tiers will have a new total loan to value. So for example, if the senior debt is 65%, uh, the subordinate lender might say we'll only lend up to 75%. And so in this example, that's what's happening. So the subordinate debt will pick up the remainder of the loan amount. So between 65% and 75%, this is an additional million dollars. So here you can see you can either pick between the new loan to value amount or you can pick a dollar amount. So here we have 1 million and you can manually enter that just as well as you can manually enter the new loan to value. Now, just to show you how this works, if this senior debt was 75% and then we put in 75% for the subordinate debt, this would automatically cancel out any loan in uh, the subordinate debt table. And this is also the same for uh, the mezzanine financing as well. You can pick between the new total loan to value or you can pick a dollar amount. So below the loan amount, we have uh, the annual interest rate input. And then below that, we have uh, the term, amortization period, and interest only period, which are all going to be input um, as months. Now, there are two mechanisms that are built in here that will alert you if your term is longer than your amortization period plus your interest only period. 
one mechanism gets triggered by making an error in uh, the term input. So, for example, let's, let's make it a little more interesting. Let's make the interest only period 10 months. Um, so, there, when you have an amortization period of 120 months and an interest only period of 10 months, you can't have a term longer than 130 months. And so, if you input 131 months, for example, it'll give you a pop up box that will say that your input is too large. And if you're working on the other side of the equation, in either the amortization period or the interest only period input cells, uh, then what happens is these cells will turn red uh, to warn you that this uh, equation has been broken. All right, so let's fix this error and then let's move on to the next input cell. So this is the loan type um, and this will allow you to pick between three different ways that the lender calculates interest. Um, we have 3360, uh, we have 365 360 otherwise known as actual 360 and we have 365 360 otherwise called actual 365. I'm not going to explain um, how these interest calculations are calculated here but there is a blog post that I've just put up on the website and I've put in a link below in the description uh, to this video so if you want to know more about that you can click on the link and read how these um, interest calculations work additionally if you want um, and this might even be more beneficial is you can come down to these amortization schedules and you can open up uh, the group and you can study the uh, amortization schedules themselves and you can see here's the 3360 amortization schedule the 365 360 and the 365 365 and you can kind of go through the formulas and, and figure it out as well all right so let's head back up to the input section and let's finish up and then we can move forward and I can explain to you um, how the rest of the model works so below the loan type we have the loan fees charged uh, at the time you secure the loan and then under that we have uh, which we have mentioned before some important numbers that you can look at as you alter your assumptions such as the total interest payments the total payments uh, for the entire loan and the balloon repayment as well as your loan fees so underneath the loan fees we have a cumulative LTV so as you go forward throughout the tiers uh, this will automatically add up the total um, loan amount and divide it by the actual purchase price. Now the reason you might need this is that in the model as you can see here in the mezzanine debt you can do a total dollar amount as opposed to a new total LTV where there you see that your new total LTV is going to be what you input. But if you do a dollar amount that's not immediately apparent and so underneath in this in this row in row 30 you'll be able to see the new cumulative uh, loan to value. Now the rest of the input section is dedicated to the option of funding your capital expenses. Uh, now this first row basically asks the question if you're funding CapEx, yes or no. And if it's no, these will all, um, all the cells below uh, row 31 will turn black in the input section. And it will basically, the, the formulas that go into calculating it down below will turn off that, that portion. Now this is uh, critical to making sure this model works right and this is the part of uh, this video that you should pay most attention to if you're going to want to fund capital expenses. So you should scroll down to row 196 or yeah, row 196 and actually row 235 you want to click the plus button to open up um, this table here. Now this table is going to calculate all your capex funding for each of the loans whether you're doing the senior subordinate or mezzanine loan this is where all the calculations happen now between rows 199 and 201 this is essential for you to plug in your own monthly capex expenses here now for the purposes of this model in this example I've created a second tab and the second tab just has a capex portion of a DCF model and I just manually inserted um, 
just random numbers here where I'm going to be funding CapEx, whether it's tenant improvements or leasing commissions or just other capital expenses. And this, um, this sheet is funneling into this portion of the model. As you can see, if you look up in the formula, it's, it's the sheet is labeled CapEx, so it's CapEx cell E12. And this goes all the way to the end. Now I want you to notice real quick how all of the tables below are blank right now. Whether we have the senior senior debt, subordinate debt, or the mezzanine debt capex financing. And the reason is because up in the input section, all the questions when they ask are we funding capex, they all say no right now. So even though we have capex now input from the other sheet, um, these questions all say no, and so we're not seeing anything down here for new additional loan payments. So now what happens if we answer yes to one of these questions? So here we're answering yes, and these four cells now open up. And additionally, if we scroll back down to the CapEx tables, we can see new loan payment calculations um, for senior debt. Uh, that's funding the cap, the additional capex. So back up to the inputs uh, and return summary table, you can see that there's an option to fund a percent of tenant improvements, a percent of leasing commissions, and a percent of other capital expenditures. And on top of those input cells, um, it will show the total amount of the new funding from the loan that is going to be uh, drawn. So now the final part of the debt inputs and return summary table uh, shows combined loan uh, details. So we have the total LTV, the total loan amount, and the approximate weighted average cost of debt. Now what this doesn't account for is the different loan terms and if you're going to be funding additional capital expenditures. So it's not entirely accurate. It's just a good rough gauge of what you're paying, uh, what your weighted average cost of debt is. Um, here we'll have the total interest paid on all the loans and then the total payments that you'll be making on the entire loan, on all the loans together. All right, so now that we've wrapped up with the debt inputs and return summary table, let's move on to the debt financing cash flows table. This table is meant for the user to be able to input these cash flows back into their own DCF model. These rows basically draw from the amortization schedules below. So it's fairly straightforward. You can see, for example, in E39, it's basically equal to E55, which is taken from the senior debt amortization uh, table below. Now the amortization schedules chosen um, in this table here are based on what the user inputs um, in row 24 on loan type. So for example, with senior debt, we have we have uh, the actual 365 loan chosen. So what we'll see in the senior debt is the amortiz amortization schedule for the 365, 365 uh, loan. And so it's basically picked from this box down here, which has all three options, all three amortization schedules laid out whether it's the 3360, 365, 360, or 365, 365. And what ends up being put into this amortization schedule is one of these three amortization schedules below and that is a result of what the user chooses here. So I believe that wraps up um, the explanation of this debt module. I hope that gives you a better understanding of how to how to work this whole thing and as always if you have any questions or comments please feel free to contact me um, through our website at adventuresincre.com thanks a lot